Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Supporting Internationally Trained Professionals in Integrated English Literacy and Civics Education Activities. Our webinar today is generously sponsored by English Discoveries, and we have Jill Rosalick on, who's going to share a few words with us. Jill? Uh, let me unmute, and I'm going to share my screen. and. Um... Here we go. First of all, thank you so much for that introduction. I am so grateful to be here and be with you today. Um, again, my name is Jill Roslick, and I am from English Discoveries. English Discoveries is a complete English language learning solution. We are used by 2 million folks every day around the world in over 30 different countries. Um, but rather than me telling you about that, I'd love to show you a video on that. Welcome to English Discoveries, the complete English language learning solution. English Discoveries is developed by EduSoft, a subsidiary of Educational Testing Services. ETS is the world's largest private educational assessment and research organization and creator of the TOEFL and TOEIC tests. EduSoft's experience in English language learning, combined with ETS's recognized leadership in the world of assessment, provides the most effective English learning solution in the market today. English Discoveries is a customizable end-to-end -end assessment and learning solution, providing students and educators with effective and user-friendly tools to maximize learning outcomes. Our solution provides an effective core curriculum in both distance and blended learning environments. The English Discoveries interactive learning platform delivers a complete cutting edge learning experience with field proven pedagogical approaches. Automated feedback helps students develop their speaking and writing skills. English Discoveries provides a variety of formative and summative assessment opportunities in line with the highest industry standards. A data-driven learning environment provides actionable information to enable teachers and administrators to improve learning outcomes. English 
English Discovery's classroom materials reflect and reinforce the teaching objectives of the online learning content and promote communicative interaction in face-to-face -face and synchronous classrooms. EduSoft's professional development solutions provide teachers with the tools and skills necessary to make the most of our distance and blended learning models. Our implementation teams work hand in hand with our customers to ensure your learning goals are reached. We provide ongoing pedagogical consultation, account management services, and technical support. To learn more about how the English Discoveries solution can take your English program to the next level, contact us today. All right, thank you so much for your time and watching that video. And before I, I leave today, I just wanna remind everyone that we do offer a guarantee to all of your ESL programs out there who are serving more than a thousand students annually. Um, and you're currently providing all of those students with fixed licenses. Uh, our concurrent license program will guarantee you a savings. And we'd love to talk to you about that whenever you would like. Um, we offer multiple types of packages. So we're very customizable and work for your program. If you would like more information, please just go ahead and scan my QR code here. This is gonna give you my contact information, our website, a little bit of detail. And so if you can get, would like to get in touch with me, you'll be able to. Again, I thank you all so very much for your, your time here today, and um, I'm happy to have been here. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to uh, James. Thank you, James. Jill, thank you so much. Wonderful video, and thank you for your partnership and sponsorship of today's mm -hmm. webinar. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was my pleasure. All right, so our presenters today, we have Jesse Stad. She's the project manager for the Enhancing Access for Refugees and New Americans project. Deborah Means West is the director of network and resource development within the West's Global Talent Bridge program. And Travis Combs is the chief of the innovation and improvement branch at the US Department of Education's Office of Career, Technical and Adult Education. Please welcome them by saying hello in the chat uh, box. I see that uh, people are already uh, commenting in there. Let us know where you're calling in from today. That'd be great. If you have questions during their presentation, feel free to submit those in the Q&A box. And with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm um, really excited to be here today and certainly just want to also do my part to welcome everybody to today's webinar around supporting internationally trained professionals. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Deborah Means West and I'm the Director of Network and Resource Development at West Global Talent Bridge. And I'll be one of the presenters for today's webinar as well as the moderator for our event. Um, before I go any further, I really also just want to start off by thanking COABE for this opportunity to be able to share insights and information with each of you today. I'm really excited for the information that we will share, but also for some of the comments and the questions that hopefully will surface from all of you. So um, for the next hour, you're gonna hear from the three of us, and we're gonna share information about how you can support adult learners with international education. We'll provide each of you with introductions on us shortly, um, as well as an overview of internationally trained professionals in the United States. Um, we'll use the reference ITPs throughout the webinar. We'll talk and share some guidance on being able to support ITPs in specifically adult education programs. We'll talk about some of the barriers as well as some of the solutions. And when I say solutions, I really mean the programmatic solutions as well as the national level resources that exist to support your work with this internationally trained population of adult learners as well as highlight some of the best practices at the local as well as the state level, and hopefully not only just share what we're aware of, but also be able to solicit some input from all of you that are joining us today. 
We'll also want to make sure that we're sharing with you some of the valuable resources that we're aware of so that each of you can make sure that you're applying it in your day-to-day -day work with this population. Um, and time permitted, we certainly want to be able to allow time for questions um, and some answers to some of the questions that each of you might have as you're working with this population. So as many of you are likely aware, um, you know, this afternoon, we're, we're dealing with a lot of um, important issues, but I want to make sure that we're also providing an opportunity in which we can just go over some of the housekeeping as it relates to this webinar. So each of you are aware of what it is that specifically you'll be gaining, but also what it is that you'll be receiving afterwards. To ensure the clarity of today's flow, um, we want to make sure that we're starting off with general introductions, which again, it's really exciting to see some of the names that have popped up here into the chat. But we also want to provide an opportunity for each of the panelists and each of you to to dive in a little deeper to the ways in which you're seeing immigrants and refugees more represented in adult education programming. The session is going to be recorded, as was mentioned, and we'll make sure as well that each of you have access to the slide deck. I believe that'll be emailed to all of you after the presentation. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the value of it being recorded is that if you need to um, refer back to something in the future, if you want to be able to um, refer back to this, um, there's obviously a way in which you're able to do that, which is great. Well, I also want to just make sure that I reference that if any of you have specific questions or comments that may resonate with something that you're hearing being presented today, please feel free to use the Zoom chat so that you can make sure that you're sharing that. As I'm sure all of you are aware, likely if you have something that hits you that you're hearing a presenter, a presenter talk about, it's very possible that it's also resonating with somebody else. So feel free to use the chat so we can try to keep today's session as interactive as possible. Um, and while we certainly want to do our part to make sure that we're keeping this session as interactive and informative as possible, I also want to um, take a moment to just plug social media and remind individuals that if you're on Twitter, if you're on LinkedIn, and you're hearing something that specifically you think might be of value to share out to someone else, just make sure that you're tagging um, our organizations, our programs, so that we can make sure that we're doing our part to amplify the message, but also make sure that you're tagging COABE so that certainly others within the membership are able to make sure that they're aware and hearing the information that's being shared today. You know, it's our intent that at the conclusion of this webinar, you will hear about new ways in which you continue your work, but also to support and enhance your work and working with immigrants and refugees in your communities and on your programs. So as was mentioned, um, we want to do a little bit of our, introdu our, our introductions as well. We've certainly excitingly in the chat seen some of the programs and the ge geographic spread of individuals that are joining us. But I'd like to make sure that we also just provide you with a little bit more of a background as to the presenters for this today's webinar. Um, so as was mentioned at the start, we have Travis Combs, who's the Chief of Innovation and Improvement at the branch of the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education. And in his role, he assists in overseeing the implementation of various research and evidence-based technical assistance activities for OCTA's Division of Adult Education and Literacy. He is heavily involved in providing leadership and guidance on initiatives that support and facilitate the implementation of new approaches and alternatives to address current and anticipated problems faced throughout adult education programs nationwide. Thank you, Travis, for joining us today. We're also joined by Jesse Stad from RTI International. And as was mentioned, she's the project director for the Enhancing Access for Refugees and New Americans project, also recommend, referred to as EARN. This project, funded by the US Department of Education for the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education. She works on ACTE, OCTE's national activities, including the Literacy Information and Communication System, referred to as LINCS, as well as Advancing Innovation in Adult Education and Integrated Education and Training in Corrections. Jessie began her career in adult education as an instructor and program manager at an Adult Education and Family Literacy Act funded program in Washington, DC. Thank you, Jesse, for joining us today. Um, and as was mentioned at the beginning, my name is Deborah, and I'm here from an organization called World Education Services, West for short. We're a nonprofit social enterprise that's dedicated to helping internationally educated individuals achieve their educational and professional goals in the United States, as well as in Canada. In 2011, 
West Global Talent Bridge was formed and specifically charged with furthering and reinvigorating the West mission. And we do this in three specific ways. We seek to elevate the issue of immigrant and refugee inclusion. We support the development of programs and policies that meet the needs of skilled immigrants and refugees. And we serve as the hub of a network that advances opportunities for skilled immigrants and refugees to contribute their talents to their full potential. We achieve this by joining with institutional partners, some of which are joining us as attendees on this webinar today, community-based organizations, and policymakers to help immigrants and refugees use their skills, leverage their training, and achieve their academic and professional goals. I really wanna thank everyone for taking the opportunity to introduce themselves in the chat. Um, it's so great, as I mentioned, to see some of the familiar names that have popped up, but I did mention that we wanna to try to keep this session interactive. So if you'll um, allow me, we'd like to just continue with that for a brief moment. And so I'd like to just once again, um, encourage folks to use the chat, because um, what we wanna do is looking at this slide, just get a little bit of a better sense as to who each of you are that are joining us and your level of interactions with this population. So if you wouldn't mind, um, would like to just ask if we can take a moment and if you can just pop your response into the chat, which of these best um, represents the program that your institution works um, works with this population. In describing your inter um, interactions, do you feel as though A, you have a program or a service that's specifically dedicated to immigrants and refugees? Is it more likely be that you're actively partnering with employers or possibly other institutions and organizations to support this population? Um, or are you here today because you're really interested in exploring further ways of being able to work with this population in adult education programs and services? So I'll just give a couple of seconds. It looks like we have some great responses that are coming through. This is really exciting. Thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to interact. So it looks as though from the organizations, um, from, from the attendees that are joining, we have a range of interest levels um, and a range of organization representations that's here today. So it's probably no surprise to each of you that when we talk about immigrants in the US, um, there are more than 45 million immigrants in the United States, and that's more than any other country, according to the latest um, census estimates. That's approximately 13.6% of the U.S. population, um, which interestingly enough is about the same uh, percentage as it was about a century ago. But over the years, it's fair to say that we have seen significant shifts in where immigrants and refugees are coming to the United States from, where they're ending up once they arrive here, and what levels of education and experience they bring with them. What might surprise some of you is that despite the fact that individuals arrive, um, whether or not we have a program and we're seeing them, we're partnering with folks in our community, individuals that are arriving with different levels of education um, sometimes experience situations in which their experience is not fully utilized. A prime example of this might be that you, on your lunch break, go out to a restaurant or to a cafe that's nearby, you strike up a conversation as you're ordering your coffee with the barista, and you find that that's an individual that may have actually been a medical doctor from a country outside of the United States. Um, despite the fact that in the United States, there's many um, places that have economic need, there's career pathways that are on offer and sectors across the US which could leverage the skills of these individuals, many learners with post-secondary education and experience are currently left unemployed or underemployed. And when we think about the impact of this, it's always helpful to see the data. So what we'd like to do is just get a better sense for all of you around what the numbers tell us for the impact of individuals that are underutilized in the United States. So again, one last interactive um, opportunity here. When we think about immigrants and refugees that are affected by skill underutilization in the U.S., wondering if we can get a sense from individuals what you think. Do you feel as though it's more likely that it's around 765,000? Do you feel as though it's around 980,000? Um, do you feel as though it's C, 1.2 million? Or based on what you know, based on what you might see in your own community and area, do you think that it's roughly over 2 million? So again, I'll just give a moment for folks to sort of put some responses into the chat. Um, 
And for those of you that actually chose letter C, you're right. It's estimated that more than 2 million immigrants and refugees with college degrees are currently unemployed or underemployed, of which it's worth noting that 60% of those hold credentials that were earned outside of the United States. But thankfully, through progressive work from strong leaders in the field, innovative program models and partnerships, as well as federal and state resources, such as the ones that we're gonna hear about today, there are steps that are being taken to move the needle on better supporting this population. And so what I'll do now is I'll pass it over to Travis so that he can share with us a little bit about how the Department of Education through the Office of Career and Technical Assistance is playing a critical role in supporting the needs of ITPs. Travis, over to you. Thanks so much, Deb, and thanks for the wonderful introduction, and thank you to COABE and World Education Services for raising and highlighting um, the importance of serving adult learners who are immigrants, refugees, and new Americans. Um, for those of you who may not know, the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act program, or AFLA, enacted as Title II of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, uh, is the principal source of federal funding uh, for state adult education programs. AFLA is administered through or by the Office of Career Technical and Adult Education, uh, OCTE, and provides a variety of services to youth and adult learners um, aged 16 or older, including but not limited to adult education, literacy, workforce preparation, English language acquisition activities, integrated English literacy and civics education, and integrated education and training programs. Additionally, we owe a codified in Section 243, a new program of expanded IELCE activities or integrated English literacy and civics education activities. The program provides education services for English learners, um, including professionals with degrees and credentials in their native countries. The federal adult education program defined by AFLA and WIOA promotes high quality evidence-based instruction and professional development through state leadership funding provisions. The AFLA program provides critical services and activities uh, that support adult learners to, by improving access to education and training opportunities, as well as employment, and aims to assist adults to become literate and obtain the knowledge and skills and employment and economic self-sufficiency, support the educational and skill development and achievement of parents and family members to participate in the educational development of their children and to improve economic opportunities for families, assist immigrants and English learners to improve their English and math proficiency and to better understand the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, as well as assist incarcerated individuals to strengthen their knowledge and skills that promote successful reentry into society. Next slide, please. So we're gonna share, a, I'm gonna share a little bit of data um, with you all. The uh, one thing that we're really excited about in the Office of Career Technical and Adult Education is we've seen a 27% increase in enrollment in, from PY 2020 to PY 2021. Um, when we say PY, we're talking program year, um, July 1 to June 30th. Um, and so you'll notice on the slide, you'll see 899,692 enrollments. Um, and for all periods of participation, the adult education program um, had 920,567 uh, enrollments um, through the United States in program year 2021. Next slide. Please. The next slide here breaks down enrollment by ethnicity. Um, and as with in the increase in enrollment across the country, we're also in seeing we're also seeing an increase in um, enrollment by ethnicity in, in all of our um, categories. So you'll notice here um, for, we saw the largest um, increase in our Hispanic population um, from going from 316,000 up to 420, close to 427,000. Um, and we anticipate seeing this uh, enrollment increase by ethnicity um, increasing in, in future years as well. The next slide. This slide here is just a, a breakdown um, showing enrollment by distribution by program. Um, in PY20, you'll notice the ESL program um, 
was at 32% enrollment and in PY20 it's 36%. So we saw 4% enrollment or 4% increase there. Um, and then in the IELCE program, you'll notice that it also had a 4% uh, enrollment in increase as well. Um, we did see a, a decline in the adult basic ed and as well as the adult secondary education programs. Um, but we are seeing that again, the increase in the ESL and IELCE programs. Next slide. This slide here is um, a breakdown of the internationally trained professionals that are served by the federally funded adult education system. Um, basically, out, it's identifying the, the number of students who enter into our programs with um, uh, education in their home country. So you'll notice in this table, um, 52,407 um, learners reported having uh, a secondary high school diploma or alternate credential um, when they came into the program. In PY21, there were 90, close to 99,000 um, learners who had entered into um, our programs that had not had a U.S. post-secondary professional degree, or th they had a non-U.S. post-secondary and professional degree. Um, and that's about 11% of all program participants, um, which is something that, that we have noticed uh, and is a direct result um, and as a direct result of, of noticing the, the high percentage of learners entering our programs with post-secondary and professional degrees um, came up, the EARN project, um, which we'll get to here in just a little bit. Next slide. Um, just a couple updates on uh, what the agency is um, currently working on and what the administration is focusing on. On February 2nd of 2021, President Biden uh, issued the executive order 14012, which is focused on restoring faith in our legal immigration system and strengthening integration and inclusion efforts for new Americans. Through this executive order, the administration mandated um, that the federal government develop welcoming strategies that promote integration, inclusion, and citizenship, and um, also mandated that it needs to embrace the full participation of the newest Americans in our democracy. Um, sections 5C and D of the executive order established um, the Interagency Naturalization Working Group, which is currently comprised of 13 federal agencies, um, including the Department of Education. The Naturalization Working Group is led by the Department of Homeland Security, um, USCIS Office of Citizenship, um, and OCTA is, um, OCTA's Division of Adult Educational Literacy is the leading ed, um, is leading ed's role in the um, Naturalization Working Group. And you can find more information um, at the link provided on this slide. Um, it, it'll give you a breakdown of um, all of the things and steps that have uh, taken place up until now um, and movement uh, in meeting the, the executive order action. Next slide. We're also um, providing an update on the White House Task Force on New Americans. Um, President Biden, uh, in executive order, 14012 um, also called for the reconvening of the task force on new Americans. Um, the purpose of the task force is to coordinate federal government efforts to welcome and support immigrants, including refugees, to catalyze state and local integration and inclusion efforts. Um, this task force is building on the work that was undertaken by a similar task force established in 2014 under the Obama Biden administration which really helped to jumpstart integration efforts across the federal government um, at the state and local levels as well. Current efforts um, that are being undertaken are the conduction of an inventory and assessment of current integration policies and programs across federal agencies. Um, this task force is currently working across the federal government, um, engaging with external stakeholders, holding listening sessions, identifying and assessing the efficacy of existing and forthcoming welcoming and integration policies and programs. Um, at the state, federal, and local levels in private and nonprofit sectors. And it's also developing recommendations for a new integration policy and strategy for the president. The task force is currently identifying gaps and areas of need and developing policy recommendations or actionable um, steps to address those needs. The task force has solicited input from external stakeholders 
um, and is currently preparing uh, a welcoming and integration action plan with recommendations that'll go to the president detailing new policy options and strategies um, to address those gaps and areas of need. Next slide, please. Within Section 242 of WIOA, the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act provides funds for the Secretary of Education to carry out a program of national leadership activities um, that really focus on enhancing the quality and outcomes of adult education and literacy activities nationwide. Um, OCTA uses our National Leadership Activities Funds really to support and improve the quality and outcomes of adult education and literacy activities nationwide, um, really with the goal of supporting state capacity building and providing collections of high quality evidence-based resources um, for adult educators at the state and local levels. Our initiatives and in federal and our investments in federal initiatives um, continue to support states' implementation of things such as content standards in adult education classrooms, the integration of technology into teaching and learning, scaling evidence-based instructional practices in content domains um, like reading, math, English language acquisition. Um, and also support the development of career pathways, um, including high quality integrated education and training programs. Um, you'll notice there's a, a Lynx uh, graphic on the slide. Lynx is Octay's national leadership initiative, um, really designed to expand the evidence-based practice um, in the field through uh, five different categories. The Lynx resource collection, which is a collection of over 800 resources um, that have been federally developed and vetted. Um, the Lynx community, which is a community of practice um, and has 13 different community groups focusing on different um, topic areas. The Lynx learning portal, which is a portal um, designed professional development, self-paced courses um, and certification uh, portal. The Lynx state resources, which really highlight uh, the federal initiatives as well as the technical assistance available through the Lynx Technical Assistance Center. And then the Lynx Learner Center, which is geared around seven um, goals uh, supporting uh, adult learners. And just a side note, Lynx demonstrates Octave's commitment to delivering high quality on-demand educational opportunities to adult education practitioners across the country and internationally. Um, next slide, please. And the last slide that I have um, to provide updates on is our investments in supporting internationally trained professionals through our Enhancing Access for Refugees and New Americans project. Um, one thing we know is AFLA has historically reached a substantial number of immigrants and English learners. Um, and when we always expanded the purpose of AFLA to assist immigrants and other individuals who are English learners to improve their reading, writing, and compre comprehension skills in English, mathematics, as well as their understanding of American systems of government, and individual freedoms and the rights and responsibilities of citizenship to support naturalization and immigrant integration. Octay is reinforcing and advancing Ed's role um, as being seen as one of the primary pillars of federal support for immigrant integration. Um, we know AFLA uh, requirements offer adult education programs um, many opportunities to support learners um, with their linguistic, economic, and self-integration needs. Um, and this matters because studying to meet the citizenship requirements, um, many immigrants also seek to continue advancing their English proficiencies, um, educational attainment, digital literacy, workforce skills. Um, given the relationship among these assets, their earning potential and ability to better support their family. Um, this also aligns with the executive order 14012, which really calls upon the United States to become a nation of opportunity and of welcome. Um, by ensuring that laws and policies encourage full participation by immigrants, including refugees in our civic life. Um, despite uh, the progress that we've made, uh, we also know that we have plenty more work to do um, and know that prior to WIOA, many career pathways supported efforts focused on promoting employment opportunities that could be acquired in um, the shortest amount of time possible. Um, but these jobs typically tended to be entry level low skilled occupations that didn't require extensive training or credentials. Um, and while this strategy has been effective for some goals and serves some individuals, um, a one size fits all model or approach for workforce development um, can be seen to be problematic and often precludes um, adult English learners, especially those with foreign credentials, um, from successfully gaining employment in a field that really best matches their prior experience, education, as well as career goals. Um, Therefore, uh, 
as mentioned earlier, when we looked at the enrollment numbers of learners coming to our programs with um, internationally, who were internationally trained, um, we're making investments through our national leadership activities, um, like the Enhancing Access for Refugees and Americans Project, um, researching and developing tailored IET services to support these ITPs. Our Enhancing Access for Refugees and Americans Project, or EARN, um, is really building uh, the state's capacities of, or the capacity of states, local programs, um, and classroom instructors to provide comprehensive immigrant integration services, really centered around the IELCE program and the IET programming. EARN broadens the focus from English language acquisition and naturalization to include new partnerships, services, evaluation methods and expanding the audiences served to include internationally trained professionals and adult learners with low levels of English proficiency. The EARN project really um, recognizes the synergy between IELCE programming and the larger new American integration efforts and emphasizes the role that adult education practitioners can play to increase the quality of services um, provided to new Americans and other English learners. Um, Again, this project is providing technical assistance and training um, that really supports the linguistic, civic, and economic integration, or the three pillars of immigrant integration um, of immigrant communities uh, through three primary audiences, which are our AFLA state staff, um, local program administrators, as well as um, IELCE instructors. And with that, I will pass it over to Jesse Stepp. We're going to hand it over to Deborah. She's going to start us off on this section. Yep. Sorry. So while we listed on this slide some of the general and commonly understood barriers that um, are unique to individuals that are internationally educated, you know, we think it's really important, uh, again, to be able to identify some of the individual barriers that contribute to um, and sometimes result in an individual's underemployment or unemployment in the US, also being able to identify some of the structural barriers that exist. But certainly we wanna be able to also drill down a little bit and talk about some of the unique barriers that might also be experienced by this population as it relates to their inclusion in adult education programming. So one of the things that we certainly wanted to do before Jesse does a deep dive into some of the barriers that we have discovered and that the EARN project um, has a new resource to talk about as it relates to serving ITPs in adult education, but also want to encourage all of you, in your roles, you likely have experienced individuals coming through your programs that have barriers. Maybe these were barriers that were identified based on the intake that you did for them to be enrolled in your program or to actually sit in your class and to be provided with instruction. So would love to be able to, as Jesse does a deep dive, also just hear some of the barriers barriers that you experience while you're serving this population. But now I'll pass it over to Jessie so that she can share a little bit more about some of the research that she's constructed and some of the resources that are specifically providing some solutions to barriers identified by this population. Thank you so much, Deborah. And yes, please go ahead and add um, some of the challenges that you've either experienced in serving ITPs or that you might imagine you would experience if you're looking to serve ITPs. Um, in the chat, and we will hopefully have a chance to talk through some of those today. Um, so as Deborah mentioned, we did identify four major barriers that we'll talk about today um, in serving ITP specifically in adult education programming, um, not just IELCE, but, but overall in adult ed. So first, um, there is a challenge sometimes in systematically identifying ITPs. Many times, if we don't ask explicitly, ITPs may not share information about their education or uh, an experience, especially if in their mind, they are just coming to your program to improve their English. They may not think it's relevant that they have a degree in biochemistry from their home country. Um, but not knowing about students' education and experience is a missed opportunity for us in helping them integrate more quickly, especially economically. Secondly, uh, leveraging student assets to help them progress efficiently towards their goals it's really important to acknowledge how much ITPs bring to the table. Not only do they have formal education, they often bring professional work experience, professional networks, and fluency in other languages. These assets might require creative thinking for adult education programs to leverage, since they might not always fit with our traditional offerings. And then continuing with that train of thought, 
Another barrier can be matching existing programming that your program is already running with students who have unique needs, like ITPs. As adult educators running busy programs with limited resources, we understandably develop classes to serve the needs of students as best we can. And that often means that an ESL class might be geared towards individuals without a high school diploma or a formal education background. And that can sometimes present a mismatch for ITPs who might not exactly fit that target audience for your existing programming. So we'll talk about that. And then lastly, ITP's credentials from their, from, uh, their home countries or other countries uh, likely need to be evaluated in order to allow them to practice, to get a job in that field, or to receive credit for a portion of their education in the US. But there are costs associated with credential evaluation, and we'll talk today about potential strategies for helping students cover the cost of credential evaluation. Um, and I just got to pop over to the chat for a minute and uh, take a look at what, what folks have said. Um, finding jobs for those with lower uh, English language skills and helping them move quickly through um, gaining those English language skills. The equivalency process of degrees from other countries, we'll definitely talk about that. Stuck in survival jobs. Um, no networking opportunities, we're going to talk about that, and the need for survival jobs as students get on their feet and figure out how to be able to um, use and optimize what they are bringing, those, those uh, experiences and, and credentials. Um, sufficient language proficiency, lack of, lack of credential recognition, needing any kind of employment, yeah, accessing transcripts, we'll talk about that. Um, Great. So I think we're going to talk about uh, really all of these at some point today. So we can move on to the next slide. All right. So uh, the first strategy, strategies for systematically identifying ITPs. Before I go too far into discussing this barrier, I just wanted to acknowledge the tremendous job that the adult ed system is doing already to serve adult learners. Our adult education system is inclusive, you know, more so than other federally funded systems which helps us serve English learners and immigrants, including ITPs, helping them to integrate into and contribute their skills and experience to their communities. As you saw from the data that Travis shared earlier, a significant portion of AFLA funded programming is geared towards serving English learners through both IELCE programming and English language acquisition programming. Additionally, we also serve English learners and immigrants in our ABE and ASE programming. The FY 2021 or program year 2021 data shows that nearly 92% of individuals served with AFLA funding are English language learners or have low levels of literacy. That high number, this statistic, really shines a light on the need to think through your program services from the lens of your students, which may be largely English language learners and may include ITPs. So th that really feeds into this idea of making sure that you really understand who you are serving especially when it comes to ITPs. By understanding how many ITPs are being served in a state's adult ed system, states can provide guidance and support to programs to improve services for ITPs. This can include guidance to programs, to programs on keeping accurate documentation of how many ITPs are enrolled in their programs, which uh, are frequently reported through the national reporting system so that we can see across the country how many ITPs are being served. So one example of a state who is uh, providing direct TA on this topic is Texas. Texas requires adult ed programs to collect information about uh, education and, tra and um, training and work experience during intake. And then the state provides technical assistance to programs on what to do with that data and how to use it to address the specialized needs of the program's population. Additionally, states can review data to identify potential ITP populations that could be served by their adult ed system, but maybe isn't being served. So county level data or state level data can show, you know, overall ITP population size in a state or region. And one way to review that data is to look at the U.S. Census Bureau's interactive map, which has uh, a way to drop down and look at your local area and searching by um, credentials and, um, and immigration. So once you have a good sense of who the population is in your community, programs can think about processes for systematically identifying ITPs, and that is often done through intake or orientation. So forms and processes should make it easy for ITPs to share that relevant information. So that often means making sure to, to ask the question explicitly um, about what educational degrees 
um, a student may have and what country they were earned in, credentials, licenses, certifications, all of that. Um, we don't always ask about professional work experience, though. I think it's pretty common to ask about education, but we don't always ask the question of, well, what did what did you do in your country? What was your what was your career path there? And so that information, that work experience, is also a really important um, asset that we we can take into account. This kind of accurate data can really help demonstrate the not only the need for serving this population and that you, you may already be doing so in larger and larger numbers. Um, but it can also help you as a program identify potential opportunities for additional um, services or programming. So, for example, if you have multiple students with a healthcare background from their home countries, there might be a, a benefit to thinking about developing, you know, a healthcare track or a pathway that those students can use to build on their background. So the next strategy is uh, thinking about leveraging student assets. And as I mentioned, all of our learners come to our programs with assets. Um, ITP's assets are just a little bit more, uh, you know, they really stand out on paper. And they can really help them move quickly towards economic self-sufficiency. And this can include, you know, credentials they've earned, literacy and fluency in other languages, professional work experience, and um, experience building social capital. So what I mean, what I mean by social capital is sort of the ability to move with confidence and, and integration and participation throughout um, your networks. And so there was a study in 2015 that really showed a correlation between uh, individuals' social networks and the likelihood of their achieving success. And because social and professional networks can take a while to establish, it, it can be hard for ITPs to leverage those other assets without the social capital that could help them ad enter and advance in the workforce in the US. And so they may need guidance on how to use their networks if they have them or build new networks, um, how to use their industry-based knowledge, how to showcase that they have this knowledge um, and show these, these, this experience as an asset. So um, support from programs and organizations that are working in the industry uh, can provide you know, mentors or internships or fellowships that can help ITPs form new connections in this country and access additional opportunities and support to continue to build that capital. So an example of where, that pro where a program has found a way to help students do just this is in Portland, Maine, where the Office of Economic Opportunity, in partnership with the Portland Regional Chamber, has developed the Portland of Opportunity Program, which actually connects ITPs to local professionals explicitly for mentorship and assistance in building their professional networks. And hopefully that leads uh, to increased employment, not just for those survival jobs, but for jobs in their career field where they're really utilizing their experience and education. Uh, programs can also look into sectors um, where bilingualism is a major value to employers. And these fields like education and healthcare, you know, they're always looking for folks who are bilingual. Those fields can be more receptive and flexible when hiring. And so those are often um, a good idea to look into those when thinking about programming to develop. Another strategy is to provide really tailored navigation and advising services to provide personalized attention to make sure that ITPs don't repeat steps <clears throat> that aren't necessary for them and are being strategic in the steps they are taking. It does require the navigator to be very careful when providing guidance, which may require outreach to professional associations, employers, to make sure that you're providing really accurate information. Okay, so as I alluded to earlier, your adult ed program may not be able to provide customized coursework to every ITP that enters your program, but you may be able to develop some programming that is beneficial to most of your ITPs. And this can include specialized classes or services to prepare ITPs for their next steps in education or careers. These can help ITPs fast track, learn sector specific vocabulary um, to help them move forward. Uh, the Literacy Council of Tyler is an example of a program that has done just that, building an ITP-specific um, class to help learners through resume building, interview prep, networking, job search, and uh, evaluation of credentials. 
Um, though services uh, through ITP specific services, it may be possible also to develop partnerships that can support ITPs in other ways. I won't go through each of these because I think we're running a little short on time, but um, they're, out they're in the resource we'll share at the end. We, there's a lot more information about all of these potential partners. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Deborah to give us a little bit more information about our last barrier, credential recognition and evaluation. So just as um, Jesse was talking about some of the strategies to be able to support individuals that may in fact have degrees or education earned outside of the US, um, one of the strategies that we'd like to suggest is really just helping folks understand one, what a credential recognition is, and then two, what a credential evaluation is in an effort to be able to support their overcoming that barrier. So a recognition really refers to the acceptance of one's academic credentials that were earned abroad. And that acceptance is something where depending upon what an individual is looking to do in their next step, whether that's to pursue further education, whether that's um, to actually pursue a career in a licensed or a regulated field, or whether or not that's to pursue an employment opportunity that's been provided to them, the recognition is what's being done by the end receiver. So the one thing that we want to really make sure, um, or actually the two things that we'd really like to make sure individuals are aware of when they're supporting Supporting the needs of ITPs is recognizing that one, the credentials that an individual has earned outside of the US, it does actually have a value. And two, that there is not a need for an individual to start over. Um, we often hear from many individuals that what they were told is that their education under overseas does not count and they need to actually pursue a high school equivalency or go through a GED program in order to actually receive a US based or a US earned um, degree or uh, educational qualification. And we know that in fact there are credential evaluations that allow for an individual to be able to move forward with the education that they've gained overseas. So a credential evaluation for um, employers, for licensing bodies, and for colleges can do basically what's listed on this slide here. Um, for employers, especially if it's a matter of being able to satisfy a requirement on a job description that says that this position is one that requires post-secondary education, a credential evaluation allows an ITP, your clients, your students, to be able to speak with authority that they do in fact meet the minimum requirements of the job they're applying for. If in fact um, a person is coming through your program and your adult learner is looking to actually pursue a pathway that's in a regulated or a licensed occupation, um, a credential evaluation is a great way for them to be able to meet the requirements as are established by the state in which they're trying to apply for that license. It will allow an individual to know whether or not there are deficiencies in their education and overseas, and if they in fact then need to take additional courses or actually sit additional qualifications to be able to apply for a license and to meet the requirements that are set out. The last one that we highlight here on this screen is around college and university admission. It's very possible that some individuals might want to pursue short-term certifications. They may actually want to build on from the education that they've received and receive graduate education. It's important to recognize that just as an individual that may have been educated in the U.S. would like to transfer their skills or their academic experience to another university or college setting, the same thing applies to an individual that has international education. A credential evaluation is a way of being able to ensure that whatever those admission requirements are, that there is in fact a verifiable way of stating that an individual meets those requirements and thus can be provided with admission to a program. I think it's really important to be able to maybe during the intake that you do with your students to ask the question around what an ITP is specifically looking to do in their short and long term goals and career planning or learning plan. Because in being able to identify what their needs are, you can ensure that they're pursuing the right credential evaluation agency to have an evaluation performed. While the organization I work for provides credential evaluations, in not all instances is a WES evaluation accepted, especially as it relates to licensed or regulated occupations, the um, pursuit of certifications. It's important to make sure that your learners are actually um, 
reviewing what the state licensing or regulatory bodies are suggesting as the preferred agencies to go through so that time is not spent pursuing a credential evaluation from the wrong agency and that a cost is not incurred that for a lot of individuals that way may in itself provide an additional barrier to them being able to receive some supports and services. When it comes to being able to discuss some strategies for covering the cost of evaluation services, because admittedly there is a cost associated to receiving a credential evaluation report, we thought that it might be helpful to provide some examples of ways in which we've seen the use of public funds to support the cost associated with a credential evaluation. These are just some examples that are provided, um, and Jesse will provide some examples related to AFLA funds, but specifically we have some examples in which we've seen through the Office of Refugee Resettlement that the Career Pathways grant that was provided to specific providers across the country also provides um, examples in which under that program, recredentialing and credential recognition can in fact be covered as an allowable expense underneath that grant. So for those of you that are on the um, webinar today, if in fact you know that your program is in receipt of those funds or if you partner with an organization for which one of your adult learners is actually um, receiving services through the Career Pathways Grant, that could be a way in which they can, in fact, have their credential evaluations covered um, through the use of federal funds. The other that's listed down here is that we have also seen in some instances some states that have partnered with and worked closely with the Office of Welfare in their state to see whether or not the use of SNAP eligible funds, specifically through employment and training, could also provide some um, financial assistance to cover the cost associated with credential evaluations. And then the last one that I just want to highlight very quickly is that we've also seen through some states, specifically through the states that have Office of New Americans, they actually may have set aside funding to cover the cost of credential evaluations. We've included in here an example of New York State that has a professional's pathway program that receives grant funding and allows for um, own a job coach agencies to use those funds to cover the cost of credential evaluations. Um, and actually, I apologize. I think I'm going to pass it to Trevor, who's going to speak, uh, Travis, who's going to speak about some strategies for covering cost through APLA funds. Thanks, Deb. Um, so I'm going to speak specifically to um, adult learners who uh, might be English learners, refugees, no Americans, um, in uh, federally funded AFLA programs. Um, to the extent that a foreign credential evaluation would be um, necessary to achieve the purposes of the IET program. So we're talking about individuals enrolled in um, an IET program or an IELCE IET program. Um, it could be an allowable expenditure as long as the cost um, is considered necessary, reasonable, and allocable um, to that adult education program. Um, a foreign credential evaluation generally, as, as Deb mentioned, results in a credential or a certificate of some sort, um, hence the connection to and coverage um, by Program Memo 19-2 that um, Octe um, put out. So if in, on, in that memo on page two um, of the guidance, it states other types of credentials or certificates may be appropriate to achieve the purpose of an IET program if such certificates document the attainment of general skills that are required to qualify for entry-level employment or advancement in employment and are a part of a career pathway. Um, there's a couple things to remember. There are two things to remember when considering whether the cost um, of conducting a foreign credential evaluation is an allowable use of AFLA funds. The first being um, that foreign credential evaluations may be allowable um, in the context of an IET program um, if the specific credential is necessary to achieve the purposes of the IET. Um, thus, Foreign credential evaluations, broadly speaking, um, would not be an allowable use of um, AFLA grant funds. So on the slide here, you'll see like an example of a nursing degree from a student's home country um, would be relevant to a student in a licensed practical nurse IET program. Um, but a student with a degree in history from their home country um, may not necessary, be necessary to achieve the purposes of an IET program um, that might be a licensed practical nurse program. Um, and then the second, the cost must be necessary, reasonable, and allocable. Um, these three criteria are mentioned on the last page of um, Octay's program memo 19-2. 
um, as that any cost must meet all three of these requirements um, uh, in order to really be considered allowable. Thank you. Um, so while we are running a little bit short on time, I certainly think um, it's fair to say that if there are questions that have been put into the chat, we'll make sure that we actually do our part to respond to those questions and have those emailed out through COEB for individuals. Um, I think we do want to um, make sure that we're just flagging on the webinar that there are some resources that we have shared here as well. Um, I think I'll also just pass it over to, um, to Jesse just to highlight a new resource through the EARN project that has come out with specifically um, the strategies as well as some of the opportunities to support and examples that were highlighted on the webinar. We have a link that's provided here as well, but I might just in the remaining minute that we have left, pass it over to Jesse just so that you can um, say anything extra that you'd like to about the spotlight. Yeah, thanks Deb and thanks everybody. Um, this was great and thanks for all your participation in the chat. This, I just put in the chat the link to this spotlight, which was just released last week. Um, it includes um, a lot of the strategies I talked about today and a lot more with a lot more detail and a lot more examples. Um, so what I did today was just a little bit of a teaser for the information that you can find in this spotlight. Um, and please let us know if you have any questions about it. And if you do, by all means, thank you again for joining us, but certainly feel free to also reach out to us via email so that we can make sure that we're also following up on any questions that you have. Really appreciate the um, interest and enthusiasm for the topic. Certainly look forward to hearing about all the supports that are gonna be provided through the individuals joining us um, and those that will hopefully be joining us on the recording. Thank you again, Coeb, for the opportunity to present and thank you, Octe, and thank you, um, Earn Project, for being able to co-present on today's webinar as well. Happy to have worked with both of you. Thanks, Deb. Bye. Thanks, Jesse. Bye, everyone. All right. Well, thank you, Deborah, Jesse, and Travis. What a wonderful presentation. And thank you, English Discoveries, again, for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, we appreciate their uh, partnership. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, if you could take a minute before you log off to fill out the one question poll I just launched, I will appreciate it. And as a reminder, this webinar will be posted to coave.org along with the presentation itself. And I will uh, grab all the questions that came in the Q&A and I'll pass that along to you guys so you can answer those questions as well and get those posted. So with that, I hope everybody has a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you so much. Bye bye.